Welcome to Media Path. I'm Fritz Coleman. And I'm Louise Palenker. At Media Path, we try to pique your interest in new ideas for things to watch and read and listen to and ponder. This time of year, we hope to ease your seasonal affective disorder. And the best part about our show is we have two guests this time. If you're a dog lover, we're going to talk to the author of a book I highly recommend. It's Pilly Bianchi, who's written For the Love of of dog. It's the ultimate relationship guide for you and your dog. It's fun and it's fascinating. And then we're going to talk to TJ Lubinsky. If you've ever watched one of those music-oriented pledge drive shows on PBS, you'll know him immediately. He produced, directed, and hosted his first one in 1999 called My Music Doo-Wop 50. His shows have become fundraising staples on public television. He just dropped his 76th show. It's Steve Lawrence and Edie Gourmet, Memories of My Mom and Dad. TJ will be with us. But first, Wheezy, before you uh, do your recommendation, I love to... You can do same with self-promotion. Some so. horn tooting? Yeah, here we go. Yeah. It's the season of giving, ladies and gentlemen, but we're, we're here at Media Path, and we're happy to offer our take on contemporary media and iconic entertainment all year long. And it's so nice when we get a little back from you, the listener. And we like to share and spread the joy around a little bit. Today, we want to mention a few things. First of all, we recently are back on Good Pods charts. We were in the top 50 podcast of the week in the TV category, hitting number 11 in the top 100 indie TV weekly chart. We also uh, are on the leaderboards where books and politics categories are concerned. And that's all thanks to you. Over on YouTube, Jonah Verhardy says, Fritz, wonderful interview with Chris Carter. Thank you. Well, Jonah, it was an absolute pleasure, and we were honored to speak to the undisputed king of Beatles knowledge. It seems like our recent chat with Chris also sparked some further discussion, as well as uh, regarding Beatles' separate discographies. Join the conversation, youtube.com slash at Media Path Podcast, and leave us a comment. Like, you know, a rating, a review, a subscribe, if you would. Wherever you listen to our show, the greatest gift of all is you. Mm-hmm. Weezy, what do you have for us? It's my turn. Okay. So uh, I'm going to be talking about an HBO Max doc called South to Black Power. New York Times columnist Charles Blow wrote a book called The Devil You Know, A Black Power Manifesto, in which he calls for black people to mass migrate back to the South and aggregate political power in order to confront and defeat white supremacy. Between 1915 and 1970, an estimated 6 million black Americans left their homes in the South, fleeing cruel Jim Crow laws and racial terrorism to seek out a new beginning in the North or in the West. In the new HBO documentary, South to Black Power, Charles Blow, a New York transplant child of the South, leads by example. He has moved to Atlanta to put his directive into action. And in the making of this film, he traverses the country to speak with politicians, historians, community activists, colleagues colleagues, friends, and his own family back home in Louisiana to explore his theory that black liberation and meaningful social change can follow this daring strategy. He is calling for black Americans to move to southern states with already large black populations where they can take control of local politics and state legislatures, thereby gaining equity and agency through collective voting power and activism. Black sweat equity built the infrastructure of the South, and in states where one-third of the population is black, the descendants of slaves should not be gerrymandered by white supremacy into one district, for example. It's a bold notion. Could it work? The film offers a variety of opinions and will help you formulate your own. South to Black Power is on Max. I'm a fan of Charles Blow. He's a recurring talking head on MSNBC. Yes. Uh, about civic issues and mm-hmm. criminal justice issues and that kind of thing. And I thought, well, this is a nice idea on paper, but are you going to convince black people to move back to the South? But apparently it's already happening. Mm-hmm. People understand there are greater economic possibilities down there, and there's a chance to change the power structure in some of these states where gerrymandering has killed the election process down there. So mm-hmm. I, I can't wait to see this, and uh, I'm glad you talked about it. I want to talk about Napoleon. Okay. It's the new movie from Ridley Scott in theaters now, soon to be on Apple TV, HBO Max, and Prime. It's the rise to power of Napoleon Bonaparte starring Joaquin Phoenix. Napoleon starts as a mid-level French military leader who, after the reign of terror, is appointed to restore France to stability. Then in 1804, he's elevated to emperor. 
This after they wanted to rid France of monarchies, but now they're making him an emperor. But even as emperor, he couldn't stay away from the battlefield. So in 1812, he leads his troops into war with Russia. The story concludes with his defeat by the Duke of Wellington at Waterloo. The movie showcases what Ridley Scott does best, action and war and gorgeous cinematography showcasing realistic, bloody war. I was most interested in Napoleon's relationship with Josephine. I think it's the best part of the movie. She's played by Vanessa Kirby, and I love her. She played Princess Margaret in The Crown. Hers was a mesmerizing performance. This was kind of a quirky relationship. It was really more of an addiction than a relationship. If Tolstoy wrote a book called War and Codependency, it would frame their love affair. (laughs) Napoleon is an addictive personality, addicted to sex and war, but there isn't much to like about the world's greatest military tactician. He never changes the expression on his face. Not really an acting stretch for Joaquin, whether it's watching... Marie Antoinette get her head cut off or commanding his troops into bloody battle, stone-faced. It's kind of Aspergery, if you ask me. Not really much of an acting stretch. What I came away with was an appreciation for the grisly, awful way that men fought wars in the 18th and 19th century. Actually, it's the same feeling I had when I watched Ken Burns' Civil War series. How do men do to each other what they do? Napoleon's place in history is... Uh, well, then he was a great battlefield genius until Waterloo. In the end, he delivered three million of his troops to their deaths. Some of the reviews said there was some questionable history in the film, but, you know, it's a movie. The most disappointing aspect for me was not once did Napoleon stick his hand in his jacket. Mm. I was looking for that. <laughs> what? I, I'm outraged. He and didn't. What, well, at what point does ABBA start singing? <laughs> That's right. Because that would be the, the applause yeah. break I mean, I moment. can watch Joaquin Phoenix, you know, as oh, they say, read yeah. the phone book. But there was literally, he could have phoned this in. It was just, there, there was no depth, there's no three-dimensional quality to his acting. It was beautifully shot. Ridley Scott's a master. All right, our first guest we're happy to have on is Pilly Bianchi. Pilly, along with Caleb Heath, has written the quintessential book for dog lovers or for people that would like to be dog lovers, but they don't understand dogs. It's called... For the love of dog. It's as if Carl Jung wrote a book about how to have a successful relationship with your dog. It's really thoughtful and very interesting and will help you to maybe have the most successful relationship you'll ever have in your life, the one with your dog. And I I came away with this going, she ought to write a book about marriage next, which would be good. Oh. Pilly, (laughs) Pilly Bianchi from the great community of Brooklyn, New York. Hi, Pilly. How are you? I'm good, Fritz. How are y'all tonight? I good love to this. You, uh, I love this book. I, I had a dog. My best friend in my life was a 12 year old golden retriever, and the most difficult thing in my life was to have to put that poor guy down. But it was it was like we 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 were spiritual brothers, and uh, I miss him desperately. So I understood the the impetus for your book. Now you wanted me to give yeah. some of. Oh the, yes, and she's got unbelievable music credits. Yeah, so. she's an author, and she's also an award-winning pianist, singer, and composer. She was a featured on-air talent for MTV's Ace Award-winning series "Turn It Up" and Dennis Leary's series "Spotlight Cafe," co-writing both theme songs. She's shared the stage with India Ari, Josh Groban, Cindy Lauper, and Jody Messina, and she's married to one of my first friends. Do you have that photo? Uh, this is a field trip that we took to my dad's store for some reason that some fourth grade teacher thought that chopping the fur off of animals and turning it into <laughs> coats would be just something fascinating for children to learn about. So you can see I'm in the I'm in the front row, and may I add I'm very proud of my dad. But and my dad was a wonderful man, but I. I, did, I never owned or wore a fur coat. Well, there's no PETA back in then. You know. Well, we oh, we Lord. knew that, that people wore leather and still do and, and everything. But it was just like, to me, a fur coat was, I would say to my dad, um, you know, my dad would say, well, do you want a coat? And I would say, Dad, I want to. I don't want to be the only girl at camp in a mink stole. <laughs> so, <laughs> so no, it wasn't for me. Uh, but I'm playing with my sock in the front row and Jay as he noted when I posted this on Facebook, is standing in the back where he's used to standing because he played the stand-up bass. <laughs> he, st- he played the stand-up bass all the way through my, my school experience. And I was jealous because I wanted to be a drummer and I wasn't allowed to play the drums. And Jay got to be in all the orchestra and all of that cool stuff. And now he's a professional musician as well. Correct, Billy? That is correct. That is correct. And I'm sorry, Wheezy, that you didn't get to play drums in the orchestra because 
in grade school, I was part of the percussion. Whoa. That was the only place that they had room for me in the orchestra was playing percussion. Oh, so. wonderful. Pilly, and, you have great look, little lines of the philosophy in this book, and I want mm-hmm. to ask you to comment on a couple of them. One is understanding dogs is a gateway to understanding other animals. And that's brilliant and simple and true. You know, it's interesting because here uh, at this juncture in in our uh, uh, relationship with nature, we're we're searching for ways to like connect more with nature and how it applies to our own lives. When this incredible species sitting and wait at our feet is a direct pathway to understanding the natural world. And if we can greater understand our dogs, we're gonna have a much greater appreciation for all of the natural world. Yeah, Mm -hmm. we've got a spy on the inside. That's our dog. He -hmm. is a part of nature and he, he lives with us. And so you make that wonderful point in your book. Tell us about your dad and Chaser. So this book came about because my father was Dr. John Pilly, and he taught our family dog Chaser of the names of a thousand objects. So his this was hard science. In his psychology career, um, when he was a professor at Wofford College in Spartanburg, South Carolina, he was one of the first scientists to actually use dogs in the classroom in the 70s, 80s, and 90s because he believed it would be far more interesting than using rats and pigeons. So he would bring our family dogs into the classroom, but he was unsuccessful in teaching them actually the names of objects so that they were independent from verbs. And this was his quest. And and he was unsuccessful because uh, most of the commands that we give our dogs are related to a verb. So in his retirement, he understood that he had these methods wrong by viewing border collie trials, getting back to nature and actually seeing these dogs in their own environment and exhibiting innate instincts that have been bred for hundreds and hundreds of years. And he was thinking, oh, wow, I got this wrong. I need to go back to the beginning and start over with a new puppy. And that puppy ended up being Chaser. And together, uh, he taught her human language. And not only did she learn the names of over a thousand objects, which were her toys, but she could combine them with verbs and adverbs, prepositions. It was the way that she was able to uh, understand sentences that garnered um this jubilant response when his formal research was published. Within 48 hours in over 72 countries, these two became media sweethearts. And the world rejoiced in the fact that my father confirmed that dogs are as smart as we think. They are smarter. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, boy, has a beautiful dog. First of all, border collies, as Chaser is, are a really smart breed anyway. But but your dad proved that they're smarter than we even give them credit for. But there's no universal prototype for dogs. They're all very much individuals, right? That's that's correct. And and we don't even like to say that border collies are the most intelligent. They are motivated. They have a motivation mm-hmm. as workers. So what we discovered and my father discovered with Chaser is that they're individuals. Chaser was very different from our other Border Collie mix. And by paying attention to her uh, unique traits as an individual dog, he was able to capitalize on the broad strokes as well. So sometimes uh, people get a little over um, uh, focused on the breed of the dog, but that gives us information on whether they're a powerhouse or a slow poke, um, but it doesn't give us information on who they are as an in- individual. Talk about the, the methodology of play because, you know, you really emphasize, and the book has beautiful illustrations and it's just got really some heartwarming prose that, that kind of help us understand ourselves and our place in the, in the universe and mm-hmm. dogs and nature. 
But when you talk about the methodology of play, you're, you're explaining, you talk about the clicker and you talk about treats as being not possibly the, the best way to train your dog. And you give some very, very concrete tips on, uh, on how to go about teaching your dog just with the understanding that dogs really love to learn and they love to be doing anything with us. You know, that's correct. And I, I yes, it's a little bit of uh, um, a slippery slope as far as modifying the current methods of dog, dog training. But this is what science does for us. Science grounds us in, in facts, you know, but the goalposts are constantly moving. So even within the dog community, it was the alpha mentality used to be very, very popular. We now know that's that's a myth. Even with wolf, wolf packs, alpha is simply the mother and father, and and the packs are the they're they're cubs. They're 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 babies, and they work in concert together. So it's not a hierarchy of dominance. Um, so what my father discovered with chaser is that play was a powerful reinforcer for her learning we dogs do get satiated on treats and sometimes other methods like clickers can come, become very distracting and i see trainers constantly using the tricker clicker and the dog is looking all around for where's the treat where's the treat without really paying attention to what's happening so by using play um Dogs don't say shape on play. I've never met a dog that could outlast me in play. And by using play as a reinforcer, um, we're tapping into an innate instinct of the dog. And uh, it it's also not just, people don't misunderstand play as well. How do you play with your dog? And it's not just giving them a toy to play with. It's that engagement. And when the dog is exhibiting a, a behavior that they like. And just like this with humans, you're gonna be likely to repeat it. So if it's fun, fun fast tracks learning. It's the same with humans, it's the same with dogs. It's the school of rock methodology. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you mentioned that, that, that uh, you mentioned wolves in your last description, uh, but you also make a point that uh, to put to dispel one of the great rumors, and dogs are not wolves, correct? People feel like they're connected or ones no. are just a slight offshoot. No, they, they are not, dogs are not wolves. Dogs have not been wolves for over 40,000 years. And what's remarkable is that dogs and humans share an evolutionary path together. So it was because of our teamwork that dogs kind of went this way and wolves went that way. Um, mm. uh, there's, there's been some research that say, well, dogs are very attuned to pointing and wolves are not as in tune to human pointing, but what's, um, what's also critical to understand in any other species, we have to view that species through their lens, not through our lens, but we have a first row seat into understanding our dogs. And if we don't capitalize on this innate evolutionary path that we've had together, it's it's a huge miss. Um, talk about a little bit about, uh, oh, you have a great line in your book where you say that dog, y y even though like it's, it's enjoyable to draw or paint dogs playing poker, that they would be horrible <laughs> poker players. <laughs> they are, there's not a dog out there that you can't read their body language. Um, so they give us, they have 18 muscles in their ears alone. So can you imagine if <clears throat> we went to a party and we saw someone we didn't like immediately? <laughs> went like this. I mean, it's the, the facial expressions. It's the, it's the hunkering down. They give us tons of information. And um, it's our job to really pay attention to these cues mm -hmm. and understand their language as well as teaching them our language. You know, you, you, you mentioned that dogs have separated from wolves 40,000 years ago, but another interesting part of your book, sort of toward the end, is you talk about the evolutionary process, and dogs 
have been sort of parallel to man's development for seven million years. They've been they've been part of man's development for seven million years. So they they probably haven't been domesticated that long. But that was an interesting process to read about in your book. It, it is, and and what what's curious is in the beginning, um, the Homo sapiens uh, or uh, were ate vegetables and dogs ate meat. You know, so gradually, you know, we started understanding each other's species on the peripheral and humans started changing, dogs started changing, uh, the dog, dogs and wolves have uh, demonstrably different paw prints. So um, when we see a paw print of uh, a dog from 20,000 years ago versus a wolf, we know it's a dog and not a wolf. Hmm. Do you guys have a dog? And have you, since Chaser, been able to teach a dog anything comparable to what Chaser learned? Well, the, the, the interesting thing about Chaser and what we want people to know is she was not, it, it wasn't Chaser that was the genius. It was the man behind the dog. Hmm. So really, with any dog, you get what you give. Mm -hmm. And... Um, what I've discovered in working with, we don't currently have a dog because Jay, my husband, is allergic to dogs. Mm -hmm. So we have two cats mm -hmm. that I've certainly tried to use my father's methods with them. No. And um, they're whole, well, sort of successful, but, you know, cats have their thing. Mm -hmm. um, they're superior bipolar beings. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> I have one too. I have my daughter's cat, cat and yeah, uh, and I don't. We don't have a relationship. We have just a. We have a, a field of understanding. Yes, they have coexistence. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. But I do have a relationship with my little rescue cat Mickey. He follows me all over the place. Mm. But that's. But that being said, <clears throat> I've been working with some rescue dogs, some, you know, pit, pit mixes that come to the house. And hugely successful in engaging with them and teaching them the names of objects through play. So the methods that we're giving everyone in our book, they're universal. They're, they're result-oriented. Um, and you're going to have fun doing it. And give the example before we close of the woman who said, uh, maybe it was a man who said, I, my dog doesn't doesn't like to play with any of her toys. She's not playing with any and if she doesn't like to play, my dog doesn't play. And you, you said, come on over. And then you showed him or her, I don't remember, uh, with a yes, pine him. cone. Yeah, mm -hmm. get, get, tell that story. So I had a friend that came over and he had a five-month-old puppy named Ruthie who was, um, she she ended up being a pit mix. She was a chocolate and lab sort of looking dog, but I, I didn't know what she was going to be. And... She was a very sweet dog, but she was not assertive. So he said, I don't know what to do with her. We have bought her all these toys and she's just not interested in them. And I said, well, how do you play with her? And he said, well, well, we don't. She's just not interested in the toys. So I didn't have any toys in my background. And I thought this was so sad. Two, two thoughts. Was she sick? And then how were they playing with her? So I soon discovered that I didn't have any toys, so I had a pine cone in my back in my backyard, and I started tossing it up in the air, and catching it, and kicking it, and and throwing it, and running after it. After it, and sure enough, Ruthie was watching. And so finally, one of the times when I tossed the pine cone up in the air, she ran for it, and then I ran for it too, and I started chasing her. And I started labeling the name of the, the object Pinecone. I would say, Ruthie, you've got Pinecone. I want Pinecone. Get Pinecone. Take Pinecone. Catch Pinecone. And we played for a while before I got tired. And Ruthie was still going full force. And not only had she learned the name Pinecone, but her her guardian had learned how to play with his dog. Mm -hmm. That it's not, it's not like... Uh parenting where you can just put your child on the porch with some toys and he'll be okay for a couple of years you actually have to <laughs> yeah we try we try that with the television you know sometimes yeah. it works <laughs> well pilly this is a great book and i'm holding it up right now and uh for the love of dog this is a brilliant 
piece of work. It's interesting and it's thoughtful. And I think the best line in this book is, Plato said, a dog has the soul of a philosopher. I thought that's about as good as it gets right there. Oh, yes, man. they get the least appreciation. <laughs> right, right. Uh, there we go. Thank Congratulations. You. Nice piece of work. It's a, it's a wonderful Thanks. book, whether you have a dog or whether you just occasionally see dogs at the park and want to know more about, you know, what, what are they thinking? I wonder what he's thinking. If you've ever had that thought, what is he or she thinking? You're going to learn a lot about what dogs are thinking. And it's, it's way more than you ever expected or imagined. Thank you so much for, for joining us, Pilly. Great talking oh, with you. Oh, thank you, Weezy. Thank you for it. Have I a great holiday. Yep. Okay. See you, you soon. Too. Bye-bye. TJ. TJ Lubinsky. There he is. The one and only. Are you in Pittsburgh right now? I am, in uh, fact. See, yeah. I just won the bet. A million dollars. I know like a lot about You're a fanboy. Okay. I am a fanboy. <laughs> Our next guest is a television show creator, producer, director, and host. He literally invented the PBS My Music Pledge Drive specials. They're all these formats on TV. His first one was Doo Op 50 in 1999. The shows are baby boomer comfort food. I love every single one of them and have seen every single one of them many times. His latest show is just dropping, Steve Lawrence and Edie Gourmet, Memories of My Mom and Dad. Steve and Edie's son and Emmy winner himself, David Lawrence, is uh, the host of the event. The, the show is the successes of Steve and Edie together and separately, the video and the sound are amazing. I think the, the, the sound must be remastered. It's spectacularly pristine. And, and here are the brains behind those great projects, T.J. Lubinsky. Welcome. Happy to have you here, T.J. Thank you both. It's great to be with you. All right. I, I've been looking forward to talking to you because your first show, the Doo-Wop 50, yeah. uh, proved that you had a great passion for doo-wop and R&B. I, too. I'm from Philadelphia. Oh, okay. And, and when you so, had... So well, when you say that, though, so I can say to you, you know the geeter with the heater. Yeah, I, you took the, you just blew my next sentence. I said the minute I, you had Jerry Blavin on there, I, I said High Ski Aruni, Fatty Ozoo, <laughs> Georgie Woods, the guy with the goods. Oh my Jock, guys, Jocko I thought we were even talking about Stephen Eady. <laughs> Go no, ahead, man. This is the stuff. This is what, and I, I just thought, wow, he got Jerry Blavin because Jerry Blavin was a, was. A, you know, he wasn't like uh, George Michael and these huge Philly jocks. He was this very specific niche of kids that loved R&B and doo-wop and stuff. And I thought he had the Gator on there. That was awesome. Yeah. Well, you know, Jerry got his whole thing from Jocko Henderson. Yeah. So mm -hmm. if you think about it, you know, he'd say he was the Gator with the heater, the big boss with the hot sauce. Right. And that really came from E to the uh, Oh, this is the job again. I'm back <laughs> on the scene with my music machine. You know, that's where it all came the first from. rapping wow. DJ. Wow. Yeah. You also have a great memory because you'll be plugging one of your albums and then break into song and do like 16 uh, bars yeah. from one of the songs. Sorry it's pretty impressive. One, yeah. No, it's good. Yeah. So well, I would love to know, what is your personal history with Steve and Edie? Did you grow up listening to them? Have you worked with them? Do you know them? Tell us how you pulled all the pieces together to create the special because you've got Carol Burnett who loves them, Michael Feinstein with his wealth of knowledge and their son, David. How did you do this? Well, okay, so I've always loved Steve and Edie. I was a young guy growing up in the Jersey Shore, Bradley Beach, Ocean Grove, that area, Asbury Park. And uh, about 14 or 15 years old, there was this girl, right? And she said, look, I like you. It's been an amazing summer, but my mother says you're not going to amount to anything. You're not going to be anything <laughs> doing this Fakakta TV stuff. I've got to be, you know, with someone who I know is going to make a good living. So I've got to go with this dentist instead. So I got <laughs> oh, to I got she a apparently has a senior house. Oh, my <laughs> God. Yeah, right. Well, I mean, OK, so <laughs> gee, I, you're, I'm dumping you. That's it. I said, wait a second. Hold on. I, I, there's something I, I feel that I got to No, You'll never be a doctor. That's it. You're out. Wow. So. <laughs> I went to the record store, this place called uh, Galaxy Records, which was in Belmar, New Jersey. And like, you know, someone else would go to their bartender. I said to the guy who owned the place, I walked in, I said, Neil, what do you got to soothe my troubled soul? <laughs> <laughs> he said, I got just the thing for you. And he gave me um, Go Away, Little Girl by oh, Steve wow. Lawrence. Yeah. And that was mm -hmm. nice, right? And I said, oh, okay, that's nice. But the flip side was something called More. Oh. Uh, which was also the theme from Mondo Connie. Terrible movie, just awful, but great <laughs> theme. 
right? Yep. And, uh, you know, more than the greatest love the world has known. And so <laughs> I was like in love. Steve, to me, was like the bee's knees. And I sent this to this girl. I, I took my bicycle and I, I rode over to Shark River Hills and I hand delivered it. I said, this is everything I'm feeling in my heart. She said, yeah, I'm still going with the doctors. <laughs> wow. <laughs> But so that's what got me in. That's what got me into Steve and Edie was was hearing those records from Steve. So what got you in the door was heartbreak, which I love because it's a human experience. And here's yes. here's here's me. I mean, I don't remember ever not knowing Steve and Edie because they were all. You know, we grew up in the age of the the variety shows and the talk shows, and Steve was on with Johnny Carton. Johnny loved Steve because Steve is hilarious. So I they were like my family members that didn't know me. But what what got me excited was. Uh, you know, I had the Donny Osmond version of, of Go Away, Little Girl. And then some, my mother must have said, you know, this is this is a cover. And I'm like, what do you, what? What do you talk? Yeah. What? Yeah, and yeah. she's like, no, no, that's a, Steve, that's a Steve Lawrence song. So I go to the mall <laughs> and I go to the record store, which was my Google, you know? So yeah. you say, well, you go through the record bins. Like, I got to find Steve Lawrence's version of this song because I, that's, you know, let's go to the source. So yeah, and then I started buying Steve Steve Lawrence records, and you can go you can go way back at your musical education, the record store. Yeah, it's funny because the record store was was everything, right? That's where right. you would go, and then you would see something and be kind of familiar, and you're like, yeah, I should have that. And for me, it started with 45s, right? And, right. and then CDs came in, so I cared about the sound more than like if it was an original pressing. So once CDs came in, then once I kind of got in the business, I started getting tapes from the record companies themselves. And But it was this great journey of discovery that, you know, people, they don't understand today. My kids wouldn't understand it. You know, you, you your mastery of music is hereditary. Going back to your grandfather, I was fascinated to learn about your grandfather, who started Savoy Records in 1942, jazz, R&B, and gospel label. Listen to the artists he had under contract. Charlie Parker, Earl Garner, Dizzy Gillespie, Coleman Hawkins, Cannonball Adderley. It was like the Mount Rushmore of jazz. Then your dad founded New Jersey's first radio station, WNJ, and your uncle Buzzy was a, mel a well-known club DJ. So it was mandatory that you went into the business you went into. Well, it was always in the background, but I, I can't say I was hip to that stuff. I wasn't hip to jazz. It wasn't my sound. Mm -hmm. I started hearing records like uh, by the Marcel singing Blue Moon. Mm -hmm. And then once you buy Blue Moon, then you have to have heartaches. And once mm -hmm. you get heartaches, then you have to hear Melancholy Baby. And once you hear that, and then you, you become a fan of that group. And that leaves you to the dubs or the Cadillacs or the Drifters. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and so I was on my own kind of, hey, this is my music. This is what speaks to me. Now, that was certainly in the background, maybe some subconscious influence, but it wasn't really like what got me into my own thing. You know, it was like doing the Steve Lawrence project, the Edie Gourmet. I, the music was not really played anymore on the radio. I discovered what I discovered. I liked it. I wanted to learn more, like going to the record store, finding the albums and, and learning more about this performer. And then after I heard more by Steve, I heard a song he did called Portrait of My Love, mm -hmm. which just completely blew me away. Then I heard his early songs like Pretty Blue Eyes and Footsteps. And and I was like, I, I was a goner. And so I had to have all of those. And so a lot of times, yes, that stuff was in the background. It led me to what I discovered, but I was very much on my own journey. I didn't have anyone pointing to me and saying, you should listen to this. You should listen to this. Mm. Except for one time, I remember very much like what happened with your mom, right? Right. Uh, I brought home 45 of the Diamonds singing Little Darling, which mm -hmm. I loved. And loved that record so much. And the flip side was the Diamonds doing Church Bells May Ring. Mm. So my father comes in the room one day and he hears me playing this 45. He's like, what What? What are you doing? I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm listening to the Diamonds, Church Bells May Ring. He's like, no, 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 no son of mine is going to listen to the Diamonds doing Church Bells. That's the Willows. <laughs> the Willows did that song. Oh, <laughs> yeah. And wow. uh he said, you go to the store and get the Willows. And I did the next day. And, and he was right. It was the R&B version. And that kind of taught me the difference between sort of Pat Boone covering Tutti Frutti and, <laughs> you know, the, the, yep. the real sound. Yeah, I yep. got it. Well, let's yeah. talk for a second about Stephen and Edie. And, and I, I know you, you must have learned a lot along the way. But as I got ready for, for your appearance today, I, I sort of did some thinking and I, 
I, I'm so, for me, Stephen Eady is just kind of like air. It's just it's always been there, and you and you need it. But when you have a brand, you have to nurture it, and you have to feed it. And within this one household, you had three brands. You had Steve Lawrence, Eady Gourmet, and Stephen Eady. All three household names, and behind each brand are human beings supporting a marriage, raising children. They have their own unique emotions, opinions, and hopes and dreams. And, and for decades, they kept all three of those brands vital. How, how did you learn that they went about it or strategized and did it? Well, OK, so just to take a step back, mm-hmm. uh, because I loved Steve's voice so much mm-hmm. uh, and I knew Edie from the novelty record thing, she did blame it on the bossa nova, although she didn't like that record. You know, the record company said, you're going to record this. And she said, no, I'm not. And they said, yes, you are. You're fired. So that's how a lot of these artists got to do a lot of the songs that we know as big hits. They didn't want to do them at all. They wanted to stick with the Tin Pan Alley and the Broadway stuff. Uh, And often the record companies were right. So I was really following Steve Lawrence a lot. And then, you know, I had learned he was um, married to Edie when I heard Blame It on the Bossa Nova. And I used to work in nightclubs. So that was a great record to play to get people dancing. And so in the in. In, in discovering them, I really wanted to do a TV show with them. And it was all about, you know, I was just getting the TV. It was 25, 28, 30 years ago. I wanted anything to see the two of these wonderful people on television together because there was no TV. There was no network specials with them. Uh, they were long gone from radio airplay. And I wanted people to see how great they were, how great the act were, how they were to each other and how much, you know, they loved their kids. They lost one of their kids very early. It was a tragic situation. And so everything I did was about trying to get them together. So I go to the manager um, or the agent at that time. And I said, look, you're not going to find anyone who loves Steve Lawrence and Edie Gourmet more than me. What is it going to take to do a TV show with them? And the manager said, well, you know, I mean, what are you calling from a TV station in New Jersey? I mean, uh, that doesn't count. Uh, Yeah. So I'm like, that doesn't count. Okay. Mm-hmm. All right. Uh, if you get someone like Dwight Hemian involved, she said, well, then I'll take it to Steve. Okay. Who's Dwight Hemian? I have no idea. Turns out he's a, a great producer director who had been around for many years, but he, he died 20 years before I was born. <laughs> and she knew that, right? So she wow. sent me on this wild goose chase to find this guy, the key to getting Steve and Edie on a show. And, and the guy was long gone, <laughs> L- long gone, dust dust and and i was never going to find him and then i would go back the next year and i would kiss the ring and i'd say please i just want to do a show with steven Eady, please, please, please and she'd give me some other dead guy to find and and this went <laughs> on for 20 years like i i do you call it a dream the deferred <laughs> to the ends of the earth i went to find these challenges that she put up and and she was just playing games she knew that she was never going to tell steve that i wanted to do this or there was an offer or any of this stuff so finally now this is this is not going to sound nice, but after about 22 years of doing this, she died. So that's when I said, uh-huh. Oh, this is like the scene in, uh, in uh, uh, um, you know, Joan Collins and Betty Davis. You know, she died. So, <laughs> so that means there may be some good things that come from this. <laughs> and I was able to call the son, and uh, the son wasn't. I, I think enamored by this manager because he kept the act away from big uh, things like the Hollywood Bowl wow. and doing major, major stuff. So we both shared this like, hey, she's dead. Let's do something. <laughs> so wow. the doors opened up. It's like heavens and heavens and earth. It just opened up and they said, yes, you can do what you want to do with Steve Lawrence and Edie Gourmet. And so that was an amazing thing. But it, it took her, sadly, leaving the mortal coil. So I have that, to, I just have to back up for a second, because I'm very interested in motive and uh, personality and what was in it for her to keep offers away from Steve and Edie. You know, sometimes these managers and Control. agents, <laughs> yeah, yeah, they just get in the way of uh of what whatever they think uh they want the artist to be or whatever their situation is and i could guess a lot about what her motivation was but the bottom line she just i think she also sensed that anything i wanted to do included teen uh the teen pop years and the teenage years steve is a teen idol and she only wanted them to be 
basically remembered for Gershwin and Cole Porter and the Ira Bernstein, George and Ira Bernstein stuff. So I, I, I was too like uh, loving of their careers in total, mm -hmm. not just one piece of it. And uh, she just didn't want that for the artist. So she stopped it every way she could. Never even took the offer to the to, to the artist. To me, it sounds like a, a Broadway musical. You've got these two beautiful, young, gifted people who meet on Steve Allen's Tonight Show. What an adventure that must have been for the two of them. Doing live TV, singing live, falling in love, starting a family, and then all of this music. It For me, it's like... Every now and then I'll check, uh, you know, I'll check Amazon to see if there's a Stephen Eady biography because I, I can't know enough about them. That's how interested I am. And she kept that from from happening. Oh, She's man. the one who stopped that from ever. I'm not the first guy who said, hey, let's do something on Stephen Eady. She would just shoot it down at every point. In wow. my case, she would just make up these stories. And it was, you know, whatever her reasons were, they were. Uh, but suddenly, once I met David, mm -hmm. I said, look. I love your mom and dad. You love your mom and dad. Sit down with me in front of a camera and just relate what you remember about each one of these songs and growing up in this Michigan household that you're from, because <laughs> it's very much like the Borscht Belt when you're, uh, you know, growing up with with uh, Steve, who's an Ashkenazi Jew. Uh, um, Edie was Sephardic. And so it was always like... Um, says this nice Jewish boy from, you know, New Jersey. It was it was very much like holding court every day. And in his house, Mel Brooks would show up or Peter Sellers would show up. All these amazing people that we take for granted was just part of their lives. Mm -hmm. And so it's really, to me, a Jewish story in a sense, because it's about these beautiful young people. They meet, they fall in love. They keep their separate identities, except for on special occasions where they do perform together. They start a family. Their youngest son was, I think, 21 years old when he died from like a sudden death syndrome, something related to his heart. And that nearly, you know, destroyed them all. Meanwhile, the younger brother, David, is still trying to go and still trying to, you know, keep everything moving with his parents. And then his dad gets Alzheimer's, bad shape, end stage Alzheimer's. Edie uh, died. 10 years ago. So Carol Burnett comes in as kind of a surrogate mother to David mm. after his mom had passed away. And so that's a whole subtext of all this. But, you know, Carol, working with her many times, which I've been lucky to do in my career, she's uh, what, you, what you see is what you get. She's just a warm, caring person. There's no pretense. There's no acting. There's no uh, uh, falsehood, falsity, none of that stuff. And she really did care that this kid no longer had a mom. And she was there to make sure that uh, she could give him motherly advice throughout the years. So all these things were sort of leading up to making this happen. And then, of course, Steve right now end stage Alzheimer's. And so he may not live through the next 24 hours or it may be two weeks or it may be two months. Mm -hmm. We don't know. But the guy that we knew as Steve Lawrence that would go and be on his TV show, he's not there anymore. And so that that's, you know, just heartbreaking for David to to deal with as we're making this TV show. Well, the sound and the video are pristine. It looks like it was shot yesterday. And uh, I, I was wondering about getting rights to all that stuff. Did David own all that video? Did you have to go to CBS and the, the networks to buy those? Or how does that work? Well, <clears throat> there's a few things. When I make television shows, I, I, I do something a little differently than other people in that uh we we shoot for sound first you know most people they'll shoot a concert and they'll hope for wonderful pictures and it sounds like whatever it sounds like i want everything that we do to sound as close to the records as possible mm -hmm. and so first of all we didn't think there was a lot of footage of steve and Edie out there simply because steve was in the army until 1960 when they when he comes out of the army he gets engaged they get married and so all those early records he never performed on TV because he was, you know, in the army now. Oh. And she was starting to sort of, you know, put her career uh, secondarily to starting a family. So there really wasn't a lot of film at all or TV shows or whatever there was. And then they did a one series um, show, which was a summer replacement um, on CBS in 1965. And it's the two of them in their prime and they're doing all these great songs and all this amazing stuff. 
And then those tapes were lost. Nobody, we, everyone believed they were gone and gone forever. Turns out Steve had a very interesting uh, uh, contract exception that nobody in the world ever has. And that is that he owned his own recordings, not just the music, but the actual videotapes. Wow. And he owns the copyright of the videotapes. Perfect. And he had possession of the tapes, which he kept in a, in a vault locked away that no one knew about in Las Vegas. So there were these 13 hour long two inch videotapes that had never been played since wow. they since they aired once on uh, the network. Wow. wow. I, 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 I have to go back and ask you about uh, some of the earlier the doo-wop specials and early rock and roll specials. Your shows, tell me if I'm right about this, seem to have gotten some bands back together. Some of those people hadn't performed together in a long time. And the the great uh, revelation in these is how good some of these people sound. I was always blown away by Jay Black and Little Anthony and some of these voices that hadn't deteriorated at all. And your show must have given them a nice boost and put them back on the road. It would seem to me that would happen. Well, yeah, but remember, nerves always comes into things. The artist has, has to really believe that you're in it to support them. And so yeah, I, it's a terrible answer, but it's the truth. You know, there's always contracts money lawyers mm -hmm. nerves uh performing live in a crowd so after i did my first couple shows and i had been making these things before i i brought them nationally to pbs i'd working locally at a local pbs station in florida um the relationships were easy what was hard was getting these artists over their nerves so we started producing them like the records and i i got um kind of a a, a thing in me where i said you know it's a shame because you're dealing with voices that are 50 or 60 or 70 years older that the audience isn't more forgiving. But if we can make it sound more like the record, then people are going to say through a visual or through an audio cue, oh, that's the sound. Mm -hmm. That's the moment. Mm -hmm. And it could be something silly like um, some part of the percussion or it could be uh, when you have certain artists uh, that the string players have to play out of tune or you don't have the sound of the record. Oh. So, yeah. you know, it's it's like going to these symphony players and saying, Boy, that was great. You guys are wonderful. Now, just one thing: uh, play it sharp or or play it yeah. flat. Yeah. And they're you know they're like, we don't do that. We're musicians. Well, you're going to do it now because yeah. it doesn't and sound you, like. And, and your shows, played. you use the same backing band for everybody. So you had charts for all those bands, and they made mm -hmm. them sound so close to the record, even though but it may be the first time they yeah, played them. Yeah, but we also brought them into the studio ahead of time, and I don't, I don't think this is a huge secret. Um, in that I'm really producing for the sound of a record. There just happens to be a live audience there mm -hmm. um, that's witnessing all this. But we don't shoot for like a live TV show. Mm -hmm. um, what we do is, uh, you know, uh, essentially, let's say we're doing the Ronettes or the Crystals or uh, Darlene Love or any of those Phil Spector acts. We start with just recording the rhythm track, which is the bass, the drum, uh, drums, bass, guitars. Mm -hmm. And we lock that into a click track. Then we add uh, strings and the strings will come in and they'll play before the concert in three or four different rooms. It's only four string players, but they'll play in a brick room and they'll play in a wood room and they'll play in a cavernous room. And then uh, we'll add the horns. The horns will come in three guys. They do the same thing to get these different sounds of these different rooms and then and mic their instruments differently each time then we add percussion then the background singers come in and do just the background parts so that by the time we get to the show we've got a live band that's playing to a click track the exact wow. orchestrations they played in the studio but now they're tripling it because you've got everything you've recorded and they're playing more on top of it so you've got this incredible sound that's identical to the record. Then the lead singers sing, and then we have the lead singers come back and sing again because often those records were double-tracked or triple-tracked. And if you don't have that, it doesn't matter what you do. You just don't have the record. So, so that's my philosophy with those live things. It's the way we've always done it, wow. and it's really the way to do it, like it's a recording brilliant. process. Brilliant. And right. did you do those all in the same theater in Pittsburgh? Where, where, where did you shoot those uh, well, a lot were in Pittsburgh, but then we've done many in New Jersey, mm -hmm. um, done a few in California, just wherever the venue makes the best sense for us, so we can mm -hmm. rent it out for a week, have 20 or 30 acts come in and come out and uh, record their biggest hits. I went to one in Thousand Oaks, uh, I made a movie about the cow sills. I went oh. to one in Thousand Oaks. Lulu was there, I think Bill Medley, 
I can't remember who else was there, but it was, I'm not sure. what the, Movie music. The theme was movie music because the Cow Sills did hair. Yeah, that was one of ours. Yeah. 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 That was, a, that was a beautiful venue. I love that oh, place. Yeah. yeah. The place is and uh, Lonnie Anderson was in the crowd that night. I remember that because she was going out with Bob Flick of the group called the Brothers Four Folk Group. Oh, and, uh, wow. Yeah, You're good. Yeah, we, yeah, we, yeah, yeah, yeah. We did a few things out there. Uh, Lulu was on that show. Yep. Yep. Which was yep. so great. And uh, yeah. Oh, BJ huh? Thomas was yeah. there. He sang oh, Raindrops. Another, yeah. yeah. What a great guy. You know, gone now. But yeah. So so you saw how, how the audience is. It's like, OK, oh. now you're going to react and now you're going to do this. And they were just sort of being pieces of the bigger thing that we're putting together. Yeah. That's they're, another they're, great thing he does on the shows. Yeah. And that is to shoot the audience because their enthusiasm is infectious as you're watching it at home. And you can just see these people having memories. And they're just mouthing these words. It's really, yeah. it's and, cute. I and sometimes it. they have to do it and they get it right away. They get, they're very happy to be a part of the production. Yeah. And if you need them to give the same reaction again, they're more than happy to. They're more than happy. Well, this to is a wonderful show. Steve Lawrence and Edie Gourmet, Memories of My Mother and Father. It, it, it's got full song performances, Steve and Edie together and them separately. And uh, really beautiful interviews, as uh, Weezy said, with Carol Burnett and Michael Feinstein. Michael Feinstein, of course, is the curator of the uh, the the Gershwin Family Music Library, I think, and many other things. I guess they performed with Carol Burnett in 1957 or something like that. She goes oh, she, back that far. They were always on her show, and Steve, and, Steve was in she was in sketches. He's a yeah, very funny guy, and I love David because he interjects these little tidbits in between some of the music pieces. But it's all about yeah, the music. Yeah, and wasn't that you know it's funny because on a spiritual level. Right. Um, <clears throat> you go through things sometimes in life and, and with this great determination, uh, hoping that you're creating some healing, healing energy and, and healing for the people involved. That's kind of my intent. Uh, mm -hmm. The other stuff that comes along, if you're on the right track, is all good stuff that follows. But going mm -hmm. into it, it's trying to give something that really creates a closure for for the performers and also for the audience taking them back when we don't have to worry about things like cancer and health problems and losing a spouse or all that kind of stuff. It's really sort of a time machine. Thing. thousand percent. And right now we're in such a dark world that this is real. Uh, this lifts you out of your head for an hour or so, and it's wonderful. And during the, right. during, during the pledge break, you know, you had a conversation with David, which I would love to have heard more of, because I'm sure that as exciting as that household must have been, Sometimes you just need your mom or dad, and they were not always going to be home that night. It yeah, was, that's true. That's both of true. his and, parents and, 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 were yeah. enormous stars. So did did he talk about what that felt like? Oh, sure. And a lot of that's on the DVD we put out. Some of it will be on PBS Passport in about a week's time or so, so people can see it there. Okay. Um, but we definitely went in what it was like, the dynamic of, of what it was like living with them. And, um, you know, the craziness, uh, mostly fun craziness of, of his mom and his dad. And he tells some great stories. Carol Burnett tells some great stories. I mean, you know, having the Carol Burnett archive to show some of these additional performances, like when they did A Room Without a House and you see Edie. I mean, you know, I always knew windows. that. I knew, Bert, I knew Bert Bacharach well. Nice guy. Uh, got along with him really well. Uh, I know Dion Warwick very well, and I'm okay. It's it's nice, but when I saw Edie do that, I was like started crying. Yeah, I was just at home. She had yeah. like a five octave range. She had an astonishing voice. And who knew? Because you yeah. couldn't see this stuff, and without this show, you wouldn't have seen this stuff. Right. I mean, you know, it, once Carol was on board, she gave us her archives. I'd already worked on the Ed Sullivan show, so I knew we had stuff in there that had never been seen. And so these doors opened up. But then the other thing that happened is there's never been a CD set, a compilation of all their work throughout the throughout the years. And so that was the other thing for me was to say, let's let's put together something that starts in the teen pop years and goes all the way through to the uh, Tin Pan Alley, to the Broadway stuff. And what was unique about that is because uh, Steve owned his masters once again. All those tapes were sitting in Las Vegas, so we got to go back to the multi-tracks and make a lot of things that were never released on CD available or put them out if they were in mono into uh, into true stereo. So that's like a whole different experience. Did David tell you if he was able to play the show for his dad? I don't know. I haven't asked him yet. Uh, I hope so. That was that was the hope for all of us. Um, 
it's a tough time for him right now. Mm. Every second of every day is uh, is volatile. So. And you understand his battle because you retired early from a radio station to take care of your ailing father when he wasn't doing well as well, right? So you kind of understand where he is in this world. My first job was working uh, maybe 14, 15 years old, working in nursing homes in uh, New Jersey. Mm. And I was kind of someone who used to help the nurses and the nurses' aides, but was also really there to get the patients active. And so we had disoriented patients and we had um, some active patients. But for the most part, it was, you know, back in the early 80s where those nursing homes weren't what they are today. And um, so I spent an all, a lot of time dealing with aging issues, what it's like to get older, what you have to face getting older. You know, I remember, it's a crazy thing, uh, which I'll, I guess I can share with you guys. I, I remember when I was offered that job, the head uh, nurse wasn't sure that a 15-year-old boy should should be hired for this position. She was hoping for someone who was older and who'd been experienced with it. And she said, what what makes you like think you can be qualified for this job? And I remember taking a walker out of the corner of the room and walking with the walker and she said well, why are you doing that i said because i want to be in the shoes of the people and feel what the people are feeling that we're going to have to take care of and so with that she said okay okay you got the job and then i did a lot of other jobs too you know in restaurants and worked in old places where i could still be a soda jerk and then eventually nightclubs and all that stuff but yeah aging issues are hard uh, my dad when he got sick uh you know it's like, what else is so important as spending time with your parents? Then my mother also who had uh, leukemia for uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, which turned to leukemia for uh, 28 years. She oh, was very boy. lucky to live that long. So, yeah, it's about dealing with with the important stuff, not not the, um, you know, the superficial stuff. Well, the beauty of your shows, uh, this one in particular, is they're evergreen. I mean, that's why I watch the Duop 50 things. When they replay those things, I watch them every time. I know all the acts, and uh, that, that's the beauty of them. They'll, they'll resonate with people regardless of how many years from now they broadcast it. Handpicked, every artist on there was because I had heard them on the radio, and I said, boy, I would love to have these artists on television. Um you know, and, and so when I started to say before, it's like a spiritual journey. You know, things happen when they're supposed to happen for a reason. I really think that's the, the truth. Mm -hmm. No matter what my determination may be for wanting it yesterday, the reality is uh, things happen when they need to. So for years, I had always um, wanted to work with Smokey Robinson and the Miracles together. And something was blocking that from happening. And I used to think... It was uh, because maybe Smokey needed some healing that he hadn't been with the group anymore. And what I found out was it was really the miracles who needed to be known that they were more than just an ampersand. It was, you mm -hmm. know, always Smokey and the miracles. Mm -hmm. Well, in the beginning, they were known only as the miracles, a group of five that blended their voice together. And it took me 15 years to figure that it was about giving them their names, national recognition, and giving them the opportunity, particularly Claudette Robinson, who was his wife. She was right. on all the records. She mm -hmm. sang on every song they ever did. And she had just been forgotten in the background. And and so it was about giving her that acknowledgement, as much as I love this group. Got to meet Smokey separately, and that was all a wonderful thing. I mean, mm -hmm. I got to meet like Mike hero yeah uh, and he was everything you want a hero to be yeah. but it wasn't the right thing at the right time i think that was the same thing with steve and edie in that uh it wasn't about giving stevie so, uh steve some help or closure with with edie's passing it wasn't about making sure the world knows about edie gourmet i really believe it was about giving david some closure at a time when there really is no closure and that we could remind the world hey you know this is how things used to be so it all goes back to intent. Sometimes you don't understand the why until after you've done the work. And that, that's fascinating. And we all have to be open to that, that we're, never, we're not always going to get what we want when we want it. But when we get it, it will make sense as to why we needed to wait. I that's love a beautiful that. piece of work. Awareness. I mean, that's just, a, you know, it's all about awareness. And mm -hmm. I, I've always been lucky enough to be aware uh, where I can see around a few corners and if you're open to it, it'll come to you. You know, crazy things, you know, happen. Like I'll be in my radio studio and all of a sudden, um, I'll, I mean, it's not a joke. This is, this is sincere stuff. Uh, a CD will fly off the wall. 
and it's like the best of Betty Everett. So you're like, wow, Betty Everett, Everett thought I heard in a long time, and blah, blah, blah. You find the CD, you put it in, she's singing for your precious love, and she's singing uh, Let It Be Me with Jerry Butler. Yeah. First track you put in. Yeah. And then you're like, well, I've got to find Betty Everett. What do I, I mean, this is, obviously, I need to find it. So you start calling and Googling at three or four or five in the morning, and you're doing this night after night. You reach someone who uh, owned the label and said, she died 40 years ago, you'll never find her. You finally find out she's living next door to this guy in a trailer park, hasn't performed in 45 years. Wow. And there she is. The guy says, oh, she's my next door neighbor. You want me to get her to fly to Pittsburgh? It's done. I'll talk to her tomorrow. Wow. And then she does come out. She has some demons. Uh, she's faced, you know, problems with, um, you know, substance abuse over the years. And first night, we think she actually overdoses. Oh, uh, God. And almost dies. Next night, uh, we had someone there with her throughout the evening. She comes out. Jerry Butler takes her hand. She takes his hand. She starts to sing uh, Let It Be Me. It was a beautiful, heartfelt moment that one of those great moments that the audience always talks about, like uh, Jay Black or like Little Anthony yeah. or, or Gene Chandler. And then within two weeks, she's dead. Oh, you so, gave her that moment. Yeah. So, so that happens an awful lot, and I'm blessed for it. You know, I don't know anything beyond that. Just that I'm aware. Of you give a lot of these artists their moment to let people know they're still alive, or that, that, or that, that to let people know what they mean and what, 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 what they brought to us, and that we're grateful. I love it when there's somebody on there and they still have their chops. And, you know, it's really fun. So, so is there a part of the rock and roll industry in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s that you haven't touched on that you'd like to before you wrap it up? No. I mean, look, there's always stories to tell and there's always things to do. Um, one of the great things is uh, this is our 25th year, 2024. And I just made arrangements to buy back all my original shows I had done when I was at uh, the local PBS station in Pittsburgh. So wow. whenever we did a show, we may have a group like The Temptations who would come on and do one or two songs. But we still recorded 10 or 12 songs with them and did interviews with them. So the next thing I'll be doing is this half hour, hour weekly series, uh, not fundraising, just saying to people, thanks you for go. your giving, yeah. thanks for your contribution. Thanks for your contribution. Thanks for giving. Now, here's what you love and talking about stories and showing footage and and bringing back what we used to have on the radio, which is, again, gone. You know, what a great idea. Tell us where folks can hear more of the Stephen Eady special that you said is available or will be available online. And so we want to include that in our show notes. Yeah, just go to uh, uh, PBS Passport in about a week. If it's not on your PBS station this week, your local station, because they all schedule for themselves. They're not like a network. Uh, and and look it up, and you'll find it, and it'll be on Passport. Uh, you can go to uh, our site, which is treasurycollection.com, and uh, we'll have information up there. But generally, just go to any PBS station and let them know you want to make a contribution. There's the DVD. There's the CD set combination of both and um we appreciate people who support because without that money you, there's no network calling saying hey why don't you spend two hours and do a show with steve vanitti you know so it's, it's important mm -hmm. people contribute yeah and it's important part to tell us what uh, the the value and the contribution to fundraising that your specials have provided well i'm very lucky uh you know in the beginning i started with um things like uh, the doo-wop shows and everybody sort of you know, called it low-hanging fruit. And I always saw it as uh, great performances for the blue-collared man mm. uh, because they would ignore this genre of music. And I think our first night, the previous record holder was Les Mis, uh, which had raised like $14 million for the system. It was the biggest thing ever. Uh, and the three tenors was close mm -hmm. to that, maybe $16 million. And then with Doo-Wop 50 in the first uh, the first pledge drive, I think we brought in close to 80 million just oh, for that first oh, show. Wow. And so we've been lucky, you know, that the audience has always supported their local station. That money doesn't go to me; it goes to their station. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, it's a wonderful thing. So, you know, the short answer is two billion with a B, two billion dollars wow. since 1998. So that's wonderful. It is wonderful. You're brilliant at what you do, and uh, thank you for the many hours of great entertainment. 
Thank, and thank you so much for this special because it was such a gift, and I and I appreciate it, everything you do. Okay, here come your closing credits. Thank you so much for joining us. We would love to continue this conversation with you on Instagram and Twitter, where we are at Media Path Pod, and on Facebook, where our show page is Media Path Podcasts, and our Facebook group is Media Path with Fritz and Wheezy Podcast Community. You can find full video podcast episodes loaded with bonus visual content on our YouTube channel, where we are at Media Path Podcast. You can write to us at mediapathpodcast at gmail.com. And if you enjoy the show, please give us a nice rating wherever you listen to your podcasts. You can sign up for our spicy little newsletter at mediapathpodcast.com, where you can find every episode to stream right there at mediapathpodcast.com. We want to thank our guests, Pilly Bianchi and TJ Lubinsky. Our team includes producer Dina Friedman, John Maddox, Bill Filipiak, Thomas Hubble, Mason Brown, Garrett Arch, Chris Baldwin, Jordan Reyes, and you. Our theme music is by me and John Maddox. I am Louise Planker, here with Fritz Coleman and T.J. Lubinsky. Be well and wise, and we will see you along the media path. That was awesome. That was awesome, T.J. Thank you so much. Well, I appreciate it. And you know, Weezy, I always love doing Jefferson's. I thought you would. <laughs> listen, that, you know, it's funny you mentioned it. Tell them why you have that name. I was a page. Uh, my name is Louise. And yeah. I, I was when I first got to Hollywood, I got a job as a page at Metromedia Square.